って。<笑>
if we look at what we know about small states and how they behave in international affairs, we know that one road to success is for small states to act smart or entrepreneurial uh, as small uh, states. And I think there are three aspects of this. The first one is to be a problem solver. We must admit that the great powers set the agenda in international affairs, but we face common problems. So small states should think, how could they add to solving these problems? And how could they cooperate with like-minded states uh, in order to make the problem solving, uh, problem solving that they can see their own interests in? The second one uh, regards the preferences of the small states. Even though we're small states, small states also have interests and the small states should define their best. It's what is it that we want to negotiate on and what is non-negotiable uh, seen uh, from the uh, small state. And finally, take advantage of being weak uh, and small. Quite often, it's more easy for small states to take on the role as chief negotiator, honest broker in the negotiations. That's really a, a road into uh, getting influence and getting some of the agenda setting power that you cannot get uh, because you're usually weak in terms of power. You can get it if you get the right position in the negotiations. Thank you, Professor uh, Guevel. Minister Christovlidis, given the complexity of the current order as analyzed by Professor Guevel, what are the main challenges and opportunities uh, you think uh, uh, small states in uh, Europe confront from a practice uh, perspective? Uh, first of all, allow me to thank you and the Delphi Economic Forum for the invitation to discuss with distinguished colleagues this very, very important topic. And uh, let me publicly thank you, Rebecca, for dealing with the small states because <laughs> as a professor very correctly mentioned, <laughs> Uh, most of the time we are ignored in this uh, international system, and especially complex international system. Uh, coming now to your question, allow me first to do an, a theoretical comment, an academic comment. Uh, when we talk about small states, it's important to make a distinction. And what I mean, um, both Cyprus and Luxembourg are small states, member states of the European Union. But nobody can claim that uh, Cyprus and Luxembourg, they have the same challenges and the same opportunities. So it is very important uh, from a theoretical point of view uh, to take under consideration the special characteristics of each uh, small state. For example, in our case, the, the biggest challenge is to face an, an aggressive uh, neighbor. The biggest opportunity is the fact that uh, we are located in a region of great geopolitical uh, importance. Uh, with a lot of uh, problems. Uh, think of example, the latest uh, developments in, in our neighborhood. Um, and uh, we, have, we have the opportunity to play the role of the honest broker. This is a characteristic that a small state can play much more successfully. We don't have a hidden agenda. So we can uh, play this, uh, this role. And also in, in our case, uh, there are other opportunities like being uh, a bridge between the region and the, and the European Union. We know the, the region much better than our colleagues uh, in, in Brussels, especially from uh, countries that are located uh, far away from, uh, from the region. Um, so special characteristics of small states, geography, political history are very important. So now, as a general comment uh, about your about your question, and given the, the complexity of the current international uh, world, the international system, the threat and the questioning of multilateralism, which is, is clear, nobody can challenge this, the questioning of the global governance, the fact that states opting instead for insularism, uh, the erosion of rules-based international system, the violation of basic human, uh, human rights and civil liberties, all those are crises and challenges that I believe they offer some opportunities to small states. Uh, so small states, they have opportunities towards two directions as we approach the, the issue from Cyprus. It's for small states to, uh, to take a multilateral lead to play uh, the honest broker, what I mentioned before. And the second one is uh, for small states to play a role towards enhance regional cooperation. It's what we call in Cyprus minilateralism instead of, of, of multilateralism. 
And I was very pleased, and I would like to mention this, I was very pleased, for example, to read last week in, in Foreign Affairs an article that encouraged the U.S. government and the new administration, the new U.S. administration, to seize the momentum created by the Amprama Accords and uh, to, to deepen them by working with small states that they don't have a hidden agenda. And there was a special reference to Cyprus uh, towards this, uh, this direction. My last comment on your question, I fully agree with the professor uh, who mentioned about the uh, we witnessing the unwillingness of the United States to play the role that they used to, uh, they used to, uh, to play. At least the perception in our region, the perception of all countries is that we see a disengagement of the United States or a selective engagement in the developments of our, uh, of our region. Uh, this is a challenge, but also it is an opportunity for the like-minded countries of the, uh, of the region working through minilateralism to work together to commonly face the challenges, but also take advantage of the opportunities. Great. Thank you, Minister Christodoulidis. Minister Dimitrov, what is the perspective from North Macedonia, a non-EU member state, and uh, a very different case from Cyprus? <laughs> yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the Delphi Economic Forum. It's always a great privilege for me to be here. And since uh, I'm here uh, in Athens, I'd like to congratulate the Greek people for the bicentennial of the revolution. Uh, first of all, a maybe brief remark on what small states are. To us, Greece is far from a, st a small state. It's a, it's a big state, so it's very relative. Uh, and it's not only size. It's also the economic potential, so the GDP, I think uh, military resources also uh, mean something. The network of friendships a country has also makes a big difference. The more friends you have, the more powerful and influential uh, you become. Uh, so um, I think we have to take that into account. I think our friend Jean Asselborn, the foreign minister of Luxembourg that Nikos also mentioned, will not be upset with us if we use Luxembourg as, a, as an example. Uh, per capita, it's probably the richest country, member state of the European Union. Luxembourg on its own is different than Luxembourg within the Benelux uh, cooperation. So regional groupings, regional cooperation clusters matter. Then Luxembourg is a member of NATO, which has another layer of, of importance, and then, of course, the uh, European uh, Union. Uh, so you also inspired me. You mentioned the Lilliputians <laughs> of, of, our global, of our global system, the Jonathan Swift's Gulliver Travel. Um, they managed to tie him up and even made him fight on their behalf to do their exactly. fighting. So I think it will be a mistake to completely underestimate uh, small states in international relations. Um, we've learned many lessons in our uh, 30 years since independence. Uh, we managed to join NATO with the support of our neighbors in, in Athens. Uh, so I think small states like predictability um, and integration. Uh, it's in some way the instinct to seek shelter. You're covered when you have bigger friends around you. Geography also, as, as uh, uh, Minister Christo Dolivas uh, mentioned, also makes uh, a big difference. It's one thing to have, to have another small state group as neighbors, or you have bigger neighbors, and it's, it's uh, quite a different story if they're friendly or if they're not so friendly. So I think we have a keen interest to uh, endorse a rules-based international system. 
where multilateralism matters. Uh, the honest brokers is, a, I think, a very interesting point because we don't really have vested interests. We are usually, especially on issues and countries beyond our region, we can definitely play that role of an, of an honest broker. So um, in our uh, diplomacy and, and foreign policy, in these last years, the approach has been to focus on the future, to focus on common interest, to make it difficult for others to raise an issue with you. Mm -hmm. So to be friendly, to be open, um, and to uh, work together. And I think this, I know that we will also discuss that in more details, this became even more important in this pandemic yeah. times, this challenge. And I can tell you many details about cooperation with Greece, with other countries in the region, that really made a difference in how we faced the challenges of the pandemic. We are going to discuss the pandemic yes. later. So, Minister Varvitsiotis, what, uh, how does Greece look at this matter of challenges and opportunities, especially after three consecutive uh, crises? Uh, let me first uh, thank uh, the guests who are here in Athens today. Uh, actually, the international participation in this uh, Delphi Economic Forum uh, makes us uh, very proud of hosting an event of uh, exchange uh, of ideas at the global level and uh, definitely at the re a regional level. Well, uh, as my friend Nikolai said, it's a kind of relativity. It's, uh, uh, it compares to, uh, well, it matters to whom you are compared with. If we are compared with China, definitely we are a small state. If we are compared to uh, Cyprus, uh, definitely we are a bigger state. <laughs> and until uh, 2004, we were one of the smallest states in the European Union. And after the enlargement of 2004, uh, we became an average size member state. Uh, I would like to, to say a few things that have to do with the European perspective of, of this issue because we are living in Europe. Definitely the global challenges are there, but we want to, to work and cooperate in a, a framework that everybody should abide by the same rules, no matter how big or small you are. You should follow the same uh, kind of procedures. Uh, definitely, you should express your solidarity at the level you can uh, contribute to that solidarity. And you have certain obligations in terms of uh, defending the common goal. The, the pandemic actually highlighted the importance of this extended cooperation. And we realized that uh, nobody could uh, serve in these turbulent ways, waves alone that we needed this extended cooperation, that we needed to, to put together uh, joint uh, uh, medical plans or vaccination plans in order to, to combat uh, the challenge. And we should also apply the same rules for traveling, for, uh, human, uh, for uh, uh, Medicare, or for the protection of our citizens. So coordination, solidarity, and actually joining a bigger group for a small state is uh, a refugee. It's a, it's a refuge. It, it's the, the point where you can actually feel that you have uh, others with which you fight the same and common challenges. Uh, let me t say two things, uh, commenting of what has been said already. Definitely geography matters. It's different to have a difficult neighbor that challenge your sovereignty. And another thing, to have uh, your cousins surrounding you with whom you speak the same language, you, you, you share the same values, and you have extended uh, economic cooperation. The other thing is how much you can participate in any global scheme. We took the example of Luxembourg. Luxembourg, no matter how much they raise their military expenditure, they wouldn't be able to find enough Luxembourg soldiers to form a big army to participate in their NATO 
obligations. So small states have also and should have also the ability to participate at a more voluntary uh, basis or more preferred upon to what their um, most uh, capabilities are uh, invested in uh, to more global uh, schemes. So actually we can do a cherry picking from the abilities of the small states in order to form and uh, form a common approach in difficult situations. Thank you. <coughs> Minister Dimitrov, given this background, what are the main goals of North Macedonia? How do you think uh, a small state and uh, North Macedonia in particular can navigate uh, complexity effectively? Yes. Um, Ever, well, since 93, I think we've set our strategic direction to be close and then join the, let's call it the political West, those values, democracies, freedoms, human rights, and <clears throat> civil liberties. So we did one. We are the youngest and the 30th member state of NATO, an alliance uh, for peace which is important in particular when times are unpredictable and where the frameworks that we have we used to take for granted are now somewhat shaken. We live in a changing world. I think the whole global system is, to some extent, is in transition. Then we are part of a region that is geographically uh, European, and encircled by member states of the European Union, even, even though many, in particular in the West, when they think the Balkans, they think we border the European Union. We are actually within. Economically, we share the European destiny. Three quarters of what we trade is with the common market. Almost half of Greece is an important trading partner. Almost half of what we produce goes to the German market. Also, about three quarters of every foreign direct investment that comes to North Macedonia is a company from one of the member states of the European Union. So we are there, and uh, we are, I think, one of the more striking sagas when it comes to European integration. A baby born in Skopje would turn 20 years old uh, if it was born on the day we signed the accession, the association and stabilization agreement with the European Union. We lost generations and, and uh, many years. Uh, we removed the obstacles. The Commission repeatedly says we are ready to start the journey, the accession talks. And one way how to help our cases, and I've been doing that lately, traveling to many capitals in Europe, is to explain why this is also in the interest of the member states and the Brussels institutions. If we want this to be a geopolitical commission, if that commission and this union cannot make a difference in the region when there is promise of membership ever since Thessaloniki 2003, uh, when we have funds through the IPA mechanism where we, we can do things, then we can forget about making a difference beyond the European Union. Then, uh, because of uh, the praise that we received in resolving bilateral issues, the reform agenda at home, I think what happens with us, whether Europe keeps its promise will be a message also for the rest of the region. Is it worth doing difficult things or not? Will Europe deliver on what they promised uh, they, they will deliver if we deliver? So I think we've managed, not only, I think these are obvious elements, to raise the stakes that our success will be a success for the European Union, will be a success for our region, the Western Balkans, and will be a success for all of our neighbors, for Greece, but also for Bulgaria and our friendship with, with Bulgaria. 
So, um, so it's a win-win it, game. Yes, I think if we frame and think and act in this lose-lose or win-win, then we have bigger chances than uh, entertaining or, or engaging in a blame game. A blame game, you can't really win when you have an issue with your neighbors, if they don't win as, if, if they don't win as well. I think Minister Stavrilevis have a lot to say <laughs> on this and what is the view from Cyprus. <laughs> Um, first of all, let me uh, briefly to comment what Nicolai say and, uh, and uh, publicly express our support for the European bid of North Macedonia. We may be a small member state, but at the end of the day we have one vote like uh, Germany, France and the bigger member states in the European <laughs> Union, true. and, uh, and uh, Cyprus vote uh, counts. And uh, I'm very concerned that uh, uh, as a European Union we are losing credibility in the Balkans. Uh, we are talking about the geopolitical European Union, but we see compared to other geopolitical actors that uh, we are losing the game. So I hope that in the next uh, few weeks it will be possible to have positive news uh, regarding North Macedonia, but in general the, the region. Uh, I recently visited the region with Mr. Demjas and we expressed both Cyprus and Greece our support for the European perspective of the Western Balkans. Now coming to, to Cyprus, um, um, in the last few years, we are trying to be uh, navigating in this uh, complex international order uh, by implementing what I say an extrovert foreign, uh, foreign policy with uh, clear focus and a clear vision regarding our, our region. Uh, as a country at the heart of the Mediterranean, uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean, with historically excellent relations <laughs> with all of, uh, of uh, our neighbors, um, a core pillar of our foreign policy is to how to work together with the neighboring countries from uh, Eastern Mediterranean, Middle East, and, and the Gulf countries. And it was, it was, and as a small state, it's very important to work with uh, uh, your neighbors in order to face the challenges, but also take advantage of the opportunities. Uh, and so that is why uh, Cyprus, Greece, Israel, Jordan, Palestine, Egypt, UAE, um, uh, we are implementing uh, a very uh, effective cooperation. We are working together in order to turn our region to a region of stability and prosperity. It is a region with a lot of problems, a lot of difficulties, a lot of challenges, but at the same time a region with a lot of opportunities. And the only way to take advantage of the possible opportunities is by, uh, is by working to, together. And this is, I'm coming again to the term that I used before, this is uh, what we call minilateralism. It is not possible to have the leading role in a, in a multilateral organization, but in the region, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, work together. And it is important to, to mention that energy was the main reason that the countries of the region, they start uh, the discussion of the regional cooperation. But uh, very soon, we, all of us witness the added value of this cooperation, and now we're discussing security, defense, health, trade, research and innovation. Exactly. And this is a clear indication of, of, the, of, the, of the importance. We also, uh, uh, we see that uh, our cooperation is recognized um, uh, by the European Union, by the United States, uh, certain EU member states are participating in a ad hoc basis in this, uh, in this cooperation. And uh, we are working on positive agenda. We don't exclude any country of the region as long as they abide with international law and they respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries. Uh, we have results, uh, and it is, it is very important, for example, that recently we had the establishment of the EMGF, the East Mediterranean Gas Forum, with the participation of Egypt, uh, Greece, Cyprus, Israel, and Palestine together in the same, co in the same organization, mm -hmm. Jordan and, and, and Italy. And uh, let me conclude by saying that we have a long-term vision. When the political conditions are there, uh, our vision is to establish a regional organization, a regional forum for security and cooperation. Um, uh, the region probably is the only region in the world that uh, no regional organization uh, 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 is established. And we believe by establishing such, a, such an organization, we will institutionalize our cooperation for the benefit 
of all countries of the region. Thank you. What about the Hellenic Republic, Mr. Varvitskiotis? What are the main goal, goals in order to navigate effectively the current complex order? Well, I think the, the, the main challenge for, for Greece is how to make the, uh, the EU enlarged in our immediate region. Uh, I'll tell you the example of Bulgaria. With Bulgaria, we had a long uh, history of uh, fights among us. And from the moment they joined the EU, we have an extended cooperation, the most uh, peaceful and cooperative uh, times that we have ever lived in, an extended economic cooperation as well, apart from the political and people-to-people -people cooperation. So uh, by actually getting Albania and North Macedonia joining the EU, finally we will get land borders with other member states. That's something that we have been deprived because from the beginning we were in an isolated part of the European Union without physical borders with the rest of the European Union. I would like to, to say that uh, the new process of enlargement that we have agreed last year should be a credible process and should be a process that actually is more speedy than the old process of enlargement through chapters and through uh, uh, negotiations that never ended. And it's important for this uh, process to start immediately for all the candidate members. We are not willing to accept any decoupling uh, between North Macedonia and Albania. We, uh, we find this to be a disastrous uh, approach to, to the regional uh, security. We want also Montenegro and Serbia to start uh, really speeding up their own process uh, in order to cooperate closely to the uh, to European Union. And as we said that uh, this process should be credible and reversible in the case that any, members, any uh, candidate member moves backwards towards uh, its obli uh, European obligation. On the other hand, the Euro Europe should keep its promises and should not delay any, any of these procedures. One more thing. We start now discussing about the future of Europe. And I've heard the President of the European Parliament uh, last Sunday calling for changing and altering the treaties that actually attribute to member states the veto power. Mm -hmm. European Union has been a revolutionary idea because the member states actually seized of their powers and granted them to Brussels. They did it under one condition, that when it comes to their national interest, they would have the veto power to block anything that will be against their national interest. And the idea that we should speed up the European Union by sacrificing the uh, existence of this voluntary uh, uh, union is, I think, against the spirit that we have tried to create all these years. And this is a union of ideas, values, and interests. Thank you. We have just seven minutes to conclude our uh, panel, and uh, I'm going to focus on uh, the pandemic. Mr. Varvitsiot, Minister Varvitsiotis, we expect that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic will transform uh, the international uh, relations, diplomacy, strategy. Are there any lessons to be learned uh, from uh, the period of the COVID-19 pandemic in order for small states uh, to succeed? A brief comment. To be please. brief. <laughs> I'm very glad we have a European vaccination plan. Otherwise, the European Union would be dissolved from within if we were having competition for the vaccines. Mm -hmm. The second is that we need extended extended international cooperation. The third thing is that we, that we are privileged to have available these vaccines to us should definitely share with the rest of the globe and especially with our immediate neighborhood. We should definitely go forward, give more vaccines to COVAX, give more vaccines to our neighbors and 
used this, uh, uh, this pool of resources that we have accumulated uh, over the last uh, year uh, as a tool in order to promote stability, to promote extended cooperation, and to deal with humanitarian crisis elsewhere. Thank you. Mr. Dimitrov. Uh, briefly, I think there are many countries who did somewhat better than bigger countries. I think Greece actually coped quite well. We all, we all had ups and downs, but I think all together, Greece is one of the countries that sets an example <coughs> how um, a rapid, engaged, centralized government can actually introduce preventive measures, um, in a way tame the spread, spread of the virus. Um, small countries have limited resources. Some countries with very limited fiscal space will struggle, especially on the economic side of mitigating the economic consequences. So, and this is why it's important institutions such as the World Bank to take this into account, because after we are done with the fight for life and health of the people, I think the economic struggles will definitely be our first priority. And I think we've learned how intense cooperation really helps. Um, we maybe could have done a bit better, but uh, the inclusion of the countries from the region in the joint procurement, the civil protection mechanism of the U European Union, really made a difference. I'm going to um, conclude. Whenever I visit uh, Greece, I come up with a new Greek word. And I started with philia, then symphonia, then galini. I'm, I would struggle if I have to translate galini into English. I think the last time we met with Miltiadis, it was Orama, the vision, the future. And now on the debate about starting accession process and Europe delivering on it in its decision from last March, we should start, North Macedonia and, and Albania. It's Tora. Tora ine i ora. Okay. <laughs> nice. Minister Christoph-Livis, what are the lessons from the COVID-19? First of all, from a, a non-foreign policy perspective, I, I think the, the pandemic showed the, the importance for the states to invest more in emergency preparedness. Uh, it, is, it is very important, and certainly to invest more uh, with long-term strategies on issues related to health. Uh, it is very important for all, for all countries to invest in science and scientific research, especially on the, on the health sector. Uh, another key lesson is the need to invest on technology and digitalization. Uh, we all witness the importance of these two, two factors. Uh, from the foreign policy perspective, uh, and I'm very glad uh, that uh, the pandemic uh, has confirmed the value of multilateralism. And uh, coming from a, a small member state, uh, being a small member state of the European Union, I want to be fully honest with you, if Cyprus wasn't part of the big European family, it wasn't possible to face the pandemic, and especially in the area of the access of, uh, of vaccines. So it is something that, uh, that we need to recognize. At the regional uh, level, uh, I would like to mention this. We also, even during the pandemic, we work with our neighbors, uh, UAE, Israel, Greece, how to face, better tackle the, the pandemic. I will never forget that uh, following a telephone conversation with my UAE colleague, in 24 hours, uh, UAE sent to Cyprus and in Greece, uh, medical uh, equipment in order to support us tackle the, uh, the pandemic. So uh, from the foreign policy perspective, uh, the, the, the most important lesson learned, it was the confirmation of the importance of multilateralism. Thank you. Professor Weevil, I think we've been overwhelmed by the practice uh, perspective, <laughs> very useful and valuable uh, experience uh, the ministers uh, shared with uh, us. And I have to say they touched upon the most important theoretical debates in uh, small state uh, literature. Uh, a brief uh, comment of uh, one minute if you had to wrap up uh, uh, the session. First of all, thank you so much for such an interesting and insightful discussion. I think it's been uh, 
it's been a very great experience being uh, being part of this, and I, I learned a lot. Three uh, uh, brief uh, comments in uh, in terms of uh, of summary. I think you uh, point to that uh, small states uh, have difference in uh, characteristics and conditions, but also that they have shared interests and solutions. So that's the the first point. The second point is that uh, these solutions often take the form of uh, cooperation that there's a continued interest and importance of the multilateral uh, institutions and the rule-based order, but also both as an arena uh, for cooperation and as a platform for influence, but also that uh, we can focus more on unilateralism on networks that can grow and become more uh, as time goes by. And finally, as, uh, as you pointed to also, take advantage of the action space, of the freedom of action that you have as, uh, as small states. As long as you have a fairly rule-based order, as you have uh, peace and are not threatened uh, militarily, there's actually a lot that small states can do. And I think the debate here has also illustrated how much small states actually do and how successful uh, they can be in, uh, in many ways. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor, thank you, Minister, and thank you all of you who attended the panel for uh, your attention.